Are you interested in geothermal systems for homes? I am very excited that Dennis, the founder and president of TerraFirma, will share all the details of his new geothermal system build with you. I am Kata, welcome to my ePoint. We're in Monument, Colorado, at about 7,400 feet of elevation on a three-acre parcel. Was all treed. We had some of the trees taken out. There will be a single-level home built, so there's no upstairs, no downstairs, no basement, no crawl space, all one level. You said you're still working on the geothermal, like the design yes. of it? Yes, so we can show you where it is now, where it's going to get put in how it's gonna be set up with the heat and the cooling. We're gonna do geothermal for the cooling. And with the solar, you can kind of see right now we're early morning or mid morning. And at this time of day, you can see the, the way the house is going to be lit up. So solar, we should have pretty good solar throughout the day, even in the winter. Mm -hmm. So that was part of our is to use uh, solar radiation to thaw and melt ice and snow on the driveway, as well as to light up the panels throughout the day. One of the things you have to keep in mind with the geothermal and with like a well or any of those types of items is to give yourself access to those. So if you were to go and say, I'm gonna sneak them into the back of the property, that's great. But if the well ever needed to be serviced, how do you get a truck back there to service it? So I'll kind of show you how we made it easy access, but yet it's not at the front door in the front of the house where we have to look at it every day. Okay, great. I'm gonna take you to that group of pipes and then we're gonna walk out and I'll show you where the well and everything goes in the back. And then we can talk about all of the in-floor radiant heat and how the cooling works and that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. Because that's what all, that's what a lot of these pipes are. <laughs> so this, as you could probably see by all of the plumbing, this is the mechanical room, yeah. if you will. So the heat exchanger will come in here. So we've got the heat exchanger and then that is for hot water. So you can see they're all in this little corner right here. Then these two big black pipes go out to the wells of the uh, geothermal. Oh, okay. So they're in, they go underneath the foundation and then uh, I can bring you back here. So they come this way <laughs> and they come out right here. The well itself, you can see that blue pipe back over through this trench over there. That's where the water well will go. And then I'm just gonna jump down quick and show you. So starting right there, you can see that orange stick. That's where the first geothermal well will go down and it's 250 feet straight down. So it's a very small hole going straight down. The nice thing about the vertical is we don't hurt the roots of the trees. If you do the horizontal, Back here, we'd have to take all these trees out and uh, make the big field. With this, we don't have to disturb any trees so we can put it straight in. So there's one there, two, three, and then that, I don't know if you see the orange stake clear back there, that's the fourth one. We have the option to put in a fifth one back over here. That's only if, they call it the manual J, it's only if that comes back and says that we need more warm air or more warm water, cool water for the heat exchanger. But we think we're gonna be able to do it with four. And one of the reasons we can do it with just the four is it's a very tight house. So when the house goes in, it'll actually be the spray in foam first. So it'll seal the house. Then we'll put in the batting. So we're looking at regular batting or there's one called hemp, hemp texture, I think they're called. We're looking at that where it's actually a hemp. And the beautiful thing on the hemp, it costs a little more but it's fire resistant. So that actually could help forest fires, et cetera, trying to build the house as much as possible that if something like that were to happen, we could survive it. But with that, it gets a roof ceiling to an R60-ish and our walls to about an R30. I think it was maybe it's R52, but either way, we're pretty darn tight house compared to a typical house, which means then we need less heat, cool, that kind of thing. A lot of homework. <laughs> Finding a lot of people who have done it before, who have YouTube channels, watching what they did and listening to what they said were great and what didn't work so well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, gladly learn from their mistakes, not mine, because that could get it very costly. Yeah, absolutely. The in-floor radiant heat with that, because now you've got the, you know, the heat exchanger. On that heat exchanger, 
a lot of big names here. So I was excited because I thought, oh, I can do this. And then you call your local distributor and they say, oh yeah, that's a European only 220 volt system. We don't actually sell those in the US. Interesting. So wow. I couldn't, even though they make them, I couldn't use it even if I wanted to use 220 volt uh, to make it run. And so, um, you know, we found obviously still some, some good quality brands out there, but that was one of the things that we had to go down those paths. I made a lot of phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people, they had no idea what I was talking about. When I'd call, uh, you know, some heating air conditioning that said they were the authorized distributor for somebody, when I'd say, I need the heat exchanger for blah, blah, blah. First, they thought I was talking for a commercial building because yeah. it's more common for commercial buildings. And then once I explained it was for my house, they said, well, why would you want to put a commercial heating system in your house? <laughs> and then I explained that they had this in Europe and he said, yeah, I can't get the European stuff. So <laughs> yeah, it, it is what it is. Yeah. So this, um, this is the, the main of the house here. So with the in-floor radiate heat on here, uh, it's obviously under, under the floor covering each room. The loops are pretty close and I can't tell you how many inches because I, I, I haven't measured it yet, but the loops are close in all of the living space. Now um, in the garage, because we have plenty of heat, why not? We have the garage heated, but we have the loops a lot further apart. So the garage will be heated, and then the house, of course, will probably stay a nice 70 degrees all, all uh, winter long um, through here. The cooling is the different piece. Uh, obviously, I should say obviously, but you shouldn't use the in-floor radiant heat for cooling, because you can. You could run cold water through it at about 45, 50 degrees. The problem is, is your floors get very cold, but the other problem is, is condensation. It's amazing, even in this dry climate, with that condensation, how your windows and everything would start fogging over in the middle of the summer because it's sucking all that cold air, it's sucking all the moisture into the house. Um, so what we're doing is a very similar, it's called an FCU, and, uh, a very similar to like a mini split idea. So in, this is gonna be an office area. In the office, there will be a wall unit that looks like a mini split but it, instead of um, using coolant, it will actually use cold water from the geothermal and run through the uh, mini split, if you will, the FCU. And then it has fans on it, it'll move the air, that kind of thing. So that's here, then um, this area is the kitchen, living room, dining room, you know, the great room, the big area. In here will be one on this side of the room, and there'll be one on that side of the room. And then each bedroom will get one as well. And they're, they're not that big, so it's not too big of a deal. And I guess having traveled to Europe often, it's so common there. It's, it's on the wall. You kind of forget it's even there. It's just another piece of furniture. But that will do a great job of keeping the house in the low 70s throughout the summer. Yeah, and you can do zoning, right? Yes, yeah, that's a good point. Everything, especially on the heat side, we could just about do every darn room we, separate if we wanted to. I think we're doing more like area zoning, just so we don't have so many thermostats going. And that thermostat really, for our case, is a temperature sensor that goes back to the automation software. Set it and forget it. Yep. For us, just to put the welds in will be about 20 grand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you got 20 grand there, then you've got the plumbing, and I hate to, you know, I don't want to say the plumbing doesn't matter, but it's not as big a deal because you're already doing plumbing in the house. But then you have the heat exchanger, that's going to add five to seven grand probably. Um, and then like I talked about those FCUs, that's probably going to add eight to 10 grand. And so now, you know, you're 35 to $40,000 to yep. put it in. And the argument is, well, if you were to do the normal HVAC with the vents and, and all those kinds of things, uh, you could put it in for 25. Right. So they'll so tell you, why are you spending an extra 10, $15,000? But we have a couple of things. What is the aesthetics? Vaulted ceilings, you know, it's kind of the thing to do. So we have vaulted ceilings. Well, with the vaulted ceilings, we'd either have to drop the vaulted ceiling to hide all the duct work up there, or we'd have to have exposed duct work. And I know the industrial look is a thing, but we don't really want to look at duct work in the house. Right. So there's that aspect of it. And then it's truly, it's pretty inefficient um, because we have all one level. We don't have multiple floors. Warm air rises, cool air falls. Well, for this, it doesn't really matter because it's so flat. Right. So that HVAC is going to have to move the air a lot more. 
So we'd have to have the just the fans, if nothing else, the fan on the HVAC running a lot more. Yeah. Uh, okay. Kind of thing. Yeah, I was also thinking direction efficiency and then also air quality. Yes. Yeah, we're putting a, it's an environmental air quality unit and it'll be down at that end of the house. And that's exactly what it'll do is the CO2 sensors will go and turn it on. It'll pull all the air out and bring fresh air in. Those FCUs I mentioned had fans, but the infrared radiant heat, the, the heat only moves if uh, doors, windows get opened, things like that. Otherwise, the heat's pretty stagnant. Yeah. Do you have an estimate of what you save every year because of the geothermal? We haven't. No. Okay. We're, we're still working through that. Yeah. The one problem we have is because we don't know how much uh, uh, BTUs we need yet. So it's hard to know compared the BTUs of, of a you know, furnace of the BTUs of this and the efficiencies right. to figure out. Um, it's almost sadly the best way to do it is to go build it and live here right? and then calculate from that. Because But you have to decide on the, the size of the system beforehand, yeah. which is tricky, right? And, and then... that's from the manual J that they do yeah. based on all the... And that was a problem we actually had was the manual J. They did the manual J as if we had a drafty house and we had normal inefficient heating and air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. So they did that and they said, well, you need, you know, I forget 75,000 or 84,000 BTUs to warm the house. Then when we gave that to Dan, who's doing our geothermal, he looked at it one, he said, you need to sharpen your pencil because your manual J is not accurate at all. But the bigger <laughs> thing was he had said was your geothermal would cost like $38,000 because you'd have to put so much in to get that many BTUs. Right. And that's when, you know, our hearts sank and like, oh, well, the dream of this kind of went away. Well, then they redid the manual J with, like I mentioned, the R50, R60 ceilings and the tight walls and, and this, that, and the other. That 84,000 dropped clear down to like 60,000. Yeah. Which automatically took looking at having to do two heat exchangers at at least five kilowatts each yeah. to one heat exchanger at either five or six kilowatts. Yeah. Um, and, and all that goes with it, the more wells, the more everything. So it brought all that price down to where the entire system is going to be under 38,000. Right. So it just back to, we have, you have to do your homework and your calculations up front. Um, right. early. Well, this is amazing. Yeah. Dennis was planning his energy efficient smart home, but had a really hard time finding valuable information. Being very busy himself, he had to do a lot of homework. If you want to avoid doing that much homework yourself, stay tuned. Give us a thumbs up if you like this. Please subscribe and see you in the next one.